Amen. Amen. Love that psalm. Of course, a psalm of praise here. And uh, I had looked at my Bible and was kind of looking at the dates of when I had dealt with certain passages. And it looks like right before the lockdown, we were in Psalm 145, praising God, extolling the Lord God. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised. One generation shall praise thy work. I will speak of thy glory and thy majesty. All men shall speak of thy might and terrible acts. The, the Lord is gracious. The Lord is full of compassion, slow to anger, and great of mercy. The Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. And that was in the spring of 2020. And here we are in the fall of 2020. And we still have opportunity. Do we still want to? Do we still have a desire in our heart to praise the Lord? We should. We should. Because though things have been confusing and scary and fearful at times and, and uh, unprecedented, as they always keep saying, um, we ought to have one standard in our life, and that's praising God for all that He has done. Over in Psalm 146, it's exactly what God encourages us. David here pens, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. But praise is expressing or, or giving proper reverence and gratitude to somebody. Praise the Lord. We, we, we praise our children. We praise our friends. We, we, we praise brethren when they do, they do things good in the church service. When people help us out, we praise them. But we ought to praise the Lord more and more and more and above all. And that's what he says, and David actually encourages. This is an exhortation to himself. He says, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He's, he's telling himself to praise God, encouraging himself, O oh my soul, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, what great things he hath done. And this is not the first time we've caught David doing this. Keep your finger in Psalm 146 and go over to 1 Samuel chapter 30. 1 Samuel chapter 30. To the left in your Bible. David built an entire life upon praising God. He's referred to as the sweet psalmist of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 30. In the last days of his life, and of his reign as king, he, he said that, he, he, he recorded for God that he was the sweet psalmist of Israel. And many of the psalms are full of praise unto God most high. Yet here David still needs to encourage himself. Oh my soul, praise the Lord. Go to 1 Samuel 30 and verse 3 and look what it says. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept till they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives. Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It's like he's reminding himself, I believe, in this psalm. It's not that exact moment necessarily where he penned this psalm, but certainly David's heart was defeated. David's heart had sunk heavily to a new low. He was greatly distressed. All around him was, was foreseeable death. Burned with fire was their very city. His Two wives and the children were gone. They wept until they had no power to weep anymore. No tears left in their eyes. And yet David says, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. David encouraged himself in the Lord. This is giving us confidence in the fact. Encouraging himself, David is. Giving us confidence in the fact that there is no time too bad to praise God. There is no situation too desperate to praise the Lord. You need to be in that position of praise at all times, ready to praise God for all that he has done. Because truth be told, though their city was burned with fire, their wives and their children, God, they were greatly distressed and they had lost seemingly everything, no power left to weep. They still have it better than they deserve. If we got what we deserve, death and hell rejoice 
that your souls, that your names are written in heaven and your soul has been saved. You can still encourage yourself in the Lord. You can still praise the Lord even when things are tough. Back in Psalm 146. And David showed this many times in his life when he was greatly distressed, when he was in a cave facing certain death, when he was having javelins thrown at his head by, by his uh, father-in-law there, Saul, when he, was, when he was being challenged, when he was being contempted by those that were of his own house, when he fell into sins. David still reminded himself, praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let's have that as a meditation of our spirits and our hearts, at least for this week. Try it out. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, O my soul. You'll remember that verse even by the end of this sermon. Praise the Lord, O my soul. You need to bring that to your remembrance and do it. Praise God. Take time to praise the Lord. Look at verse 2. Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. Verse 2, it says, while I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. He's saying, while I live, while there is any being, just being, just, just being a bump, just being there, just being present, soaking up air, while there's anything left in me, and we saw that back in the example where he just had no power to weep. They had no power to even cry. They were just being. While I have any being, David says, oh my soul, praise ye the Lord. While I live, while I'm alive, while I have even an ounce of being, I will praise the Lord God. I will sing praises unto my God. The meditation and promise to himself here he is making is, I want to praise God always. I want to rejoice in the Lord always. I want to sing praise unto him, express my reverence and gratitude for all that he is and who he is. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He says, while I have any being, just being, just being there alive and present, and I would say that you're not truly living unless you are doing this. You're not truly alive in the Spirit. You're not truly living that crucified, Spirit-led life unless you're praising God. Look at the foundations of, of that Spirit-led life. Being in the Spirit is psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving praise and reverence unto Him is foundational to you being even alive and quickened in the Spirit. David says and, and gives, gives an opportunity and, and a challenge, and I give you the challenge. When you are desperate, when you are near defeat, you can still be spiritually high by praising the Lord. When your flesh is weak, when your flesh is not able or capable to even muster a tear, to even conjure up a moment of sadness while you are simply being, well, there's any life in you, you ought to be praising God. And if you do so, you'll be living a spiritually enriched and full life. The Bible says in Psalm 22 and verse 3, it says, Thou art holy, referring to God, Thou art holy, O Thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. You want more of God in your life? You want Him to abide with you? That's His challenge is He says, Abide in me and I in thee. He wants us to abide in the vine. You want God to come and live with you? Have praises all about you and around you because He inhabits the praises of Israel. Even spiritual Israel, He will inhabit. He will dwell in our praises. That's where God is comfortable. That's where God is content. That where God is happy to be is within the praises of His people. God presides over. God reigns within. God abides in the praise of His people. And we need to be in that state in order for God to abide with us. He will be present when we are praising. Amen. Have nothing. Well, have Him. You got nothing left in the tank? Have God with you. That's what you need. When you are weak, then is He strong. That's what the Bible gives us that promise. When my flesh is weak, the Spirit within us can be strong if we will only have the praise of God on our lips, the praise of God in our hearts, the praise of God in our lives. You got nothing, at least you can have the Lord. And what more would you need if that were the case? Verse 3, again, it says, Put not your trust in princes, 
nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. Go to Jeremiah 17, keeping your finger in Psalm 146. To the right, Jeremiah 17. God says we ought not have confidence, we ought not put our trust in, we ought not to seek our help from those whom they have no help to offer for you, the sons of men, the princes, the leaders that are around you, men in general. Don't put your trust in them. Jeremiah chapter 17, look at verse 5. Jeremiah 17, look in verse 5. God wants us to be prosperous and not parched. Verse 5 it says, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. You're trusting in men. You're trusting in your peers. You're trusting in your leaders. You're trusting in those that you are serving under. You're cursed, the Bible says. Why? Because if flesh is your arm, the arm of flesh will fail you. If you're trusting in yourself, you're trusting in men, you will be cursed as a result. If you're trusting in me, you're trusting in the flesh, and you will be cursed as a result. Your heart will depart from the Lord, and that's the promise that God here is giving if you're going to trust in men, if you're going to trust in flesh, if you're going to trust in anything carnal. Verse 6 it says, For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land that is not inhabited. Parched, salted land, the wilderness, there's a desert, there is no life there, just a tumbleweed rolling through. Do you want to live like that spiritually? I think we're called to live a flourishing life. Right? I think we're called to live a life that gives bud, that grows leaves, that has fruit abiding upon it. We are called to live a fruitful life. And if we're trusting in men, we're going to be parched and we will have none of that blessing from God flowing through us, which is described in the New Testament as being fountains of water pouring out the Most High's habitation. We want to be prosperous. Continue on in verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. God is my hope. I trust in him. That's where blessing comes from. Verse 8, For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. A fruitful life comes even when things are hard. Notice the Bible describes a year of drought and yet the plentiful waters of that tree coming into her roots causes that even when the heat comes and even when the drought comes, year by year by year, there will be yielding of fruit to this tree that did what? Trusted in the Lord. That put confidence in the Lord. That said of the Lord, that's my hope. That is what I need. He is who I need. I need no other. And David in Psalm 2 says a similar thing. As a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. When he was describing that in Psalm 2, he said, Don't put confidence in the counsel of men, but trust in the Lord. It's almost as if they were inspired by the same spirit when they penned these passages individually. Going back to Psalm 160, 146. The problem with men is, is they're like a vapor. The problem with men is they wither like grass. The problem with men is they're a flower that fadeth. Even their thoughts perish. The Bible records here in verse 4 of Psalm 146. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Now, what is it saying? He's returning to his earth. We know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And yet God seems to be indicating here that this man that was trusting in princes, this man that was trusting in the Son of Man, this man that was cursed as a result, dwelling in dry places, it's his earth now. He can dwell in that earth. He's chosen that earth. What earth would God have for him? God's earth is lush. God's earth is by the rivers of water. God's earth would provide fruit in due season because it would nourish up that plant and yet this man 
died, his breath went forth, and he returned to the earth of his own choosing. His earth was where he perished, and in that very day, his thoughts perished all the same. The thing with ideologies and ideas and thoughts and, and things is, yes, we can pen them for a time. We can proclaim them for a time and influence people in our realm and in our circles. And we can, we can have thoughts that cause people to meditate and change their ways and move forward and, and adapt. And Our words can have power, but the second we die, that power is gone. Is that not, is that not the truth? Our ideologies must be absorbed by the coming generations. We ought to pen it, but that's not even good enough. It ought to be re it has to be read. And it has to be absorbed and, and, and maintained and carried forth for it to do a thing. The Bible is clear that as soon as that man that's trusted in man dies, his thoughts perish with him. That very day, they're gone. Certainly people have affected the world through the ripples of time. Certainly men have have, have penned, think of Darwin, men have penned, like, like Aldous Huxley, men have penned great books in their wickedness, big books in their wickedness that have carried through time. Marx is another one. His, his ideologies have transcended the moment that they died and breathed their last breath, but that's only because their ideologies were absorbed by the next generation, that were absorbed by the next generation, that was absorbed by the next generation. These men, their only thoughts that they have now are, I should have believed on Christ. Hell hath no torment than what these men are suffering. Why? Because they've trusted in men. They've trusted in their own flesh. They've trusted in their own arm. And they would not praise the Lord and give him his proper place. And so David here is encouraging himself, praise the Lord, O my soul, and reminding himself of the vanity and brevity of life. My breath, too, goes forward and returns to the earth. That's where I'm headed. I just die, and that very day my thoughts perish. They may have weight on my children and my children's children, but aside from that, it's gone. It's ended. It's done with. It's not ours anymore. There's a bleak and bitter end if your confidence is in men. There is a bleak and bitter end if your confidence is in men. So what ought you to do? Put your confidence in God and praise Him for all He's done. It's simple. It's easy. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. We don't do enough of giving God proper praise for all that He has done. Give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Verse 5, it says, Happy, happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Now, happiness normally has to do with happenstance or happenings. Happiness normally has to do with our situation in life. Happiness is something that everyone's seeking after, but it always has to do with outside things. And yet God here is promising that you can have happiness that simply stems from God who chooses to abide in the praise that you are currently giving to him. You can be happy by trusting God, making him your help, making him your hope. All that you need is the Lord Jesus. All that you need is Father God and his spirit working in you. Usually, again, happiness with happening, but I believe we can live outside the constraints of happenstance if we simply hope in our Lord. Seek our help from the Lord. Because the thing is, if you're just happy because of how your day's going, the next day is going to be terrible and you're going to not be happy anymore. If you're just happy because of how your family is, then they could leave. And the reality is you won't be happy anymore. If you're only happy because of the great job that you have, you might lose that job, get laid off, something completely out of your control. If you're only happy because the car you drive, the house you live in, all of these things will fade. All of these things you might as well group into that category of flesh. That arm of flesh will fail you. The arm of this earth, things that are tangible in this life. If you're trusting in those, if they're your hope, if they're your help, if that's what makes you happy is something in this life, it's just a matter of time before you're going to fall short. You're going to be hurt. You're going to be harmed. The Bible says, happy is he that hath the God of Jacob. But look at this. It says, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Who's God? Your God. Yeah, he is the God of Jacob by title. He's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Israel. He's also 
the God of Josh. He's also the God of Jamie. He's also the God of Uri. If you've, if you've called on him for salvation, he's your God too. Put your hope in him. He's a personal God. He is your God. It's not written here that he is the God of Joe, but certainly it says it's the God of him that trusteth in him. So if you trust in God, if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, for your help, for your hope, you will be happy. And that's the promise that is being made here. Why? Because you're putting your hope in something that is beyond this life and something that is immovable unstoppable, something that is, is, is unaffected by what goes on here. Now this all sounds good, but how do we then praise him? How do we sing praise unto God and get some of that in our lives? Praise the Lord, O my soul. Look in verse 6. David says, which made heaven and earth, the sea and all that therein is, which keepeth trust, which keepeth truth forever. Praise the Lord for his creation. The truth is, is that when it comes to creation, he made it and he can certainly mold it. He can move it. He can manipulate it any way he sees fit. And so we can praise him for all the things that are around us, the beauty of nature, the, the, the wonderful perfections of life that we can discover through science and invest, investigation. We can love him for, for, for just, just who we are and how we are and how we work. We can, we can love him and praise him and rejoice in the fact that he made our bodies the way he did, that he, he created bodies that can, can adapt to things that are attacking it, that can heal when it's harm that can that can that can change and adapt you can go to work one day and it hurts and the next day your body has healed that thing and you can do more of that same work without the hurt because god made you a certain way this creation is perfect this creation testifies of the glory of god and it's not just the heavenlies it's not just the earth around us but it's small little things that day by day we neglect and we don't think on and we don't give god the proper praise for our god your God did something that no other gods can, and that is create. Science tries to create. Other, other, other gods have been conjured to create, to, to, to manipulate the physical world and to do certain things. But God created something so wonderful that men can simply not replicate. And no God that is formed will prosper over this creation. The Bible says in Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. He says, and all that in them is. Referring to not just the foundations of creation, but everything that interacts upon his creation is of the Lord. And that's the tale as old as time itself. In the beginning, time started. God, our Savior, created the heaven and the earth. Time, space, matter right there in a moment in one verse he needs praise for that he spoke that and it was and he said it was very good and we ought to say yep it's very good lord i praise you for that praise him for his creation day in and day out praise him for all that he has done in that realm so that life could even be sustained where we're at in verse six the second part it says which keepeth truth forever which keepeth truth forever now we're in a time where truth faileth in the streets certainly you can even present somebody with truth agonizing for hours and they'll say i'm still going to think on that right truth is truth is is not something that people desire truth is failing in other words it, it's it's falling short of succeeding not that there's a problem with truth christ is the way the truth and the life but there is certainly a problem of receiving truth Everyone's walking around like Pilate. What is truth? What is truth? I don't know. There's no truth. My truth is your truth, and your truth, it doesn't matter. We just all make our own truths. No, there is a truth, and the Bible records here that he keepeth. God keepeth truth forever. Truth is safe. Truth is secure. Truth ain't going nowhere. Truth is solid because God is the one that keeps it. The Bible says that in the last days, those that follow after those that love those that desire to do truth make themselves a prey that's how strange it's going to be in these last days to to love and to live truth and that's what god wants for us he wants us to follow after truth he wants us to show truth reflect truth even as christ is truth he wants to be seen in us and he will be seen on us if we praise him 
then he can abide in our praise. Then everything that people will see will be Christ. And he'll get the glory that he deserves. The Bible says the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So from the time of the Psalms forever, his word is confirmed, preserved, kept in store and ready to do what it is intended to do. Certainly men will reject it. Certainly men will scoff at it. Certainly men will, will turn from it, will flee from it, will question it, will attack it. But the truth is the truth is the truth is the truth is the truth. And that doesn't change from this day forever. Look, lies come and lies go. But the truth abides. It lives. It resides. It does not budge. And that's what I love about this book. I can just read this book and I know that I'm saying the truth. My interpretations may skew from the truth, and I may tell you something indirectly that is a lie because it's not the truth when I interpret the Bible. But the reality is, if I just stand up here and read the Bible, you're getting 100% truth. The way, the truth, the life is Christ. Christ is the Word of God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We cannot separate God from His Word. He is the one that is keeping it because He is the one that it is. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's piercing dividing asunder the soul and spirit joints and marrows a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart i love the word of god it's a two-edged sword it's sharper than any two-edged sword there are lies that are two-edged swords that will cut you and will hurt you and will ruin you but if you have the two-edged sword that is sharpest cannot be overcome lies will never overcome the truth so we need to abide in the truth and trust in that but above all that give praise to god for his truth it's an amazing blessing here in North America, in Canada, in Toronto, and in our homes when we go back, that we can hold this book freely. We were talking about that today. The day may come where they ask the little children in school, how many of your parents have a big black book they like to read? There's lots of words in it. And the kids are going to put their hands up, and maybe the, the Canadian Gestapo will show up and knock on your door and say, come out and bring your Bibles with you. And they'll burn them on your front lawn. Those days have happened. Those days certainly will happen again. Or... If they don't, if they allow for the Bible to stay in people's homes, do you know what they'll do? They'll lie about it, twist it, rest it to the end that anybody that holds it will simply be deceived because they can read something. Praise the Lord. Well, the Lord is really this man, right? And it can be rested and changed to their own devices. Certainly that is possible, but... That's why more and more we just need the truth in our life. Dwell in the truth, have the truth, and praise God for his truth. Judgment, verse 7, it says, which executes judgment for the oppressed. Now these days we have a whole bunch of people with beams in their eyes walking around saying, judge not, judge not, judge not, judge not. And yet our God, if we were following our God, if we were seeking after the Father, he's encouraging us to judge because that's what he does. He judges and executes judgment for the oppressed, and he does it righteously. Now, we, of course, need to be mindful of hypocritical judgment, but we ultimately need to just give God the praise for his judgment because his judgment is always true. If you go to Psalm 119, you're going to find his judgments, his judgments, his judgments, his judgments. It's his very word of God. If you want to judge righteously, you judge by the word of God. Give him praise, give him glory for the fact that he's put it in your hands, he's put it in your hearts, and you can use it to judge accordingly. And you know what? Just praise him for the fact that he gives righteous judgment to those that are oppressed. I think the day is coming when we will be oppressed. We will be suppressed. We will be attacked for what we believe. Give God the glory because he is ultimately going to judge righteously those that are oppressed. Which giveth food to the hungry. Verse 7, the Lord looseth prisoners. Food to the hungry. Now these days that we're living in, we find the meat plants down. We find the crops are lost and dug back into the dirt as there was no one to reap them and to bring those great uh, bountiful harvests in. The supply chain was broken, was down. There's a shortage of workers. Certainly it's very possible that on the horizon we're going to see food shortages in our grocery stores as a result of this lockdown, this shutdown that took place. Time will tell what the harvest of the fall looks like. Certainly the spring harvest was one of the weakest. 
Praise God that he gives food to the hungry. There's been these strange fires that have sprouted up, entire facilities full of grains that we use for our bread just caught on fire and destroyed. What happened? Arson? Freak nature accident? Who knows? But they're gone. But in famine, our Lord feeds. Psalm 37. And we can praise him for that. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Give proper reverence. Express gratitude towards God. Psalm 37 is is one of my favorites. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Psalm chapter 37, look in verse 22. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and am now old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. God giveth food to the hungry. Give praise to him for that. Isn't that a wonderful thing that God has promised there in his scriptures that if the whole world that we live in, if our whole city were starving, his seed would not be begging bread. His seed would not be utterly forsaken. They would have their daily bread. And that's a good reminder. We need to be in the habit of praying for daily bread. That's something that's so far from our minds where we live, but there's parts of the world where people literally bow their head every morning and say, Lord, give us this day our daily bread because they don't have a fridge that's full. They don't have a pantry that's full. They don't have a fast food chain up the restaurant that they can just swipe their card at. They don't have that at their disposal. We are not in constant remembrance of the fact that we need to ask God daily for bread. Give us this day our daily bread. God, provide for us sustenance. Why? Because we're just so overfed. We have lots of food. We have all of that available. But the day might be coming where you don't. Ask him for daily bread and then praise him for his delivery. We need to get in that habit now because the day may come here in Canada. Yes, here in Canada, here in Toronto, where there is no promise of daily bread from this world. Praise the Lord. We have a promise from this God that we can have daily bread delivered to us according to his will. We will not be forsaken. We will not beg bread, but God will provide for us meat in due time. Uh, Psalm 146, in the third part of that, the Lord looseth the prisoners. Now, the reality is, is that men are trapped by sin. Of course, there's, there's sinful men out in the world, and they are trapped in that shackle and in that dungeon and the only thing that can set them free that can loose them from the bounds of sin is christ and his death burial and resurrection amen there are men trapped by sins and god here promises that he will loose the prisoners and that is one aspect of it but what about these physical prison breaks what about the potential that that could be on our horizon here as christians in canada we're seeing that in australia turn with me to acts chapter 12 we're seeing that in a sister nation, the nation of Australia, a little ways ahead of us in, in regard to totalitarianism, and I'm praying that they uprise, I'm praying they stand up to it, I'm praying that there be some, there be some righteous lawmakers and legislators that say enough is enough. There's no reason why somebody needs to be pulled out of their house and forced to have a mask, and there's no reason why somebody needs to be pulled out of their house and arrested for a Facebook post, for even the thought shared online that they might protest the lockdown there needs to be somebody that stands up and says no this isn't right to force people in their houses only allowing one of a whole household to go out one time in a week and they can't go further than five kilometers from their house there needs to be somebody that stands up and says no this is not right this is not good but if it doesn't happen more and more of these are going to be thrown into prison and i believe that that's just a dry run for what they want to unpackage in the rest of the world. We've already had announced here in Toronto one of those buildings where they call it a self-isolation building for those that can't self-isolate on their own, so they're going to put them there. It's like it's not a choice. Well, why is it self-isolation if you're going to put me there and leave me there? The ones in Australia, they lock the doors. You're in. 
Even if you're suspected of knowing somebody and coming into contact with somebody who may have had COVID, they do they they do all of these these um, these acrobatics of wording that basically says that if they just want you to go, you got to go. Now that's not how they're presenting it and unpackaging it here, but you see how it's being done over in Australia. You can see the future of those same establishments here. They want to make you a prisoner because they suspect you of having a virus or they suspect you of not wanting to go along with the social distancing or they expect you are not going to comply with the mandated vaccinations and all of these other things that could potentially unroll here if God doesn't intervene. In uh, Acts chapter 12, I took you there, we have a case of a physical prison break. And who knows if the time may come that we'll need to be praising the Lord. We should praise the Lord that he does set prisoners free. They get saved. They're saved from their sins. They are now free in Christ. We should also praise the Lord that each and every day, I believe, he's setting real prisoners that are captive free from physical prisons. And that one day we may need to lean on God for that in our circumstances. Verse 5 of Acts chapter 12, it says, Peter therefore was kept in prison. Now, Peter was one of the first Christians. He was a great Christian. He had his shortcomings and his faults, right? But it seemed like prison was a common thing for Peter, and especially for the other earlier apostles, right? Just business as usual, in prison, out of prison. The Apostle Paul was busted out of prison, and he stayed anyways just so he could witness to the jailer, right? Prison breaks is no big deal to God. Praise the Lord for that, right? We may face prison for even our positions today. We may face prison for even our assembling together as we are today. One day, this may be illegal, banned with force in prison as a result. Praise the Lord that he sets people free. Continuing on in verse 5. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So we see that prayer was made of the church in order to release Peter. They were probably praising God for all that he has done and hoping that he would let Peter out, let Peter free, but it's bleak. Look at verse 6. It's, it's telling you he's sleeping. He's between two soldiers. He's bound with two chains. There's keepers before the door. I mean, it's bleak. They're making sure that they keep him in. But verse 7 says, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Rise up quickly, and the chains fall from off his hand. Now you can continue down in verse 11. It says, And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken, named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. And they said, It is his angel. Peter was loosed, but Peter didn't believe it. Peter was loosed from prison, but the disciples didn't believe it. One of these days, you might be released from prison, but you won't even believe it when it happens. Nevertheless, praise him that he has done it and praise him that he will do it again. The last days, we might go to jail for our faith. The early Christians were our example. Christ was our example. And they were in prison, out of prison, in prison, out of prison, their whole ministry. But praise the Lord that we have examples, though it's hard to believe when you're in shackles in the inner gate and in the inner gate and you're locked up that you would ever be let out. Praise the Lord that he is able and willing and he will allow for deliverance. Back to Psalm 146 and verse 8. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteousness. He makes the blind to see. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I once was lost, now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. But even physically too, we found Christ 
making the blind to see. Bow down. Is this spiritual? Is this depression? Is this someone suffering from an ailment or a sadness? Just bow down. Or are they physically broken? In the same way, God is able, we ought to praise him for his ability to make those that are bowed down to rise again, relieving them and giving them rest from being bowed down, raising them up again. I think in the last days, the hospitals, as they are established now, might be a minefield. We might not be able to actively go to the hospitals. I already hear the announcements being made. You're going to just have to follow a questionnaire through. You know, we're already doing it. Do you have a cough? Do you have, have you vet traveled in the last 14 days? And then it'll be, do you have your vaccine? Oh, no. Well, our policy is you got to get it before you get service. And that'll be the last days. And as Christians, we know that we are pro-life. And I don't believe you can be pro-life and pro-vaccine at the same time. Because vaccines are a ministry of death and nothing but. So we need to be able to make those decisions. And we need to be able to trust in and praise in the Lord that takes somebody bowed down. Takes somebody that's sick. Takes somebody that's blind and makes them see healed and gives them relief. In the last days, we might need to rely entirely on the Lord God for healing. We may need to celebrate and praise him for all that he has done. Let's practice that now. I need to do more of this. When I get a migraine coming, I need to pray to God instead of going for my Advil, right? I need to trust in him with all my heart and praise him when he has victories over these things that seem so small in my life, things that I would normally solve with the arm of flesh, right? The righteous are loved, and you are righteous. You are unique. You are significant unto God, and we need to remember that. Be reminded of that. The Lord loveth the righteous. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, O my soul. You love the righteous. Praise the Lord, O my soul. You open the eyes of the blind. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Judgment is executed on the oppressed. Praise the Lord, O my soul. You made heaven. You made earth. We love you, God, for all that you have done. We're so thankful you love us the same. You've made us righteous and love us for that. Verse 9, it says, The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and widow. He, pre- he preserves, he relieves his own. And even others, showing grace to all, showing mercy to all. The rain falling on the just and the unjust alike. God is great and good unto all, but especially those of his own household. But the wicked, the Bible says, the wicked, he turneth upside down. (laughs) I've said it before regarding this world. Man, things are turned upside down. And when you look at it, the only reason I have any straightness, the only reason I have any clarity, the only reason I have any understanding of what's going on is because, praise the Lord, He's given me His Word. Otherwise, I would be turned upside down with the wicked. If you're attached to this world, when this world turns upside down on the wicked, you will be turned with it. This is why we need to anchor up. Right? As Christians, we don't set our anchor in the earth. We anchor up to heaven, and that's our solid rock. And that's what holds us still. That's what keeps us when the billows are rolling, when the waves are coming in, when we're when we're being blown about, when we're being tossed and turned. If we're anchored unto God and we're praising Him for all He has done and for all He will do and all He is doing, then we will be preserved and we will be relieved in these last days. And we won't suffer the up turn, the upheaval that the world is seeing. Literally, you're seeing towns that were a peaceful town turned upside down by violence and strife. You're seeing you're seeing people that were sane and of clarity of mind turned upside down, caught in confusion and misunderstanding and anger. You're finding people that normally had their feet firm on solid ground that are just a mess because of what's gone on. The world has been turned upside down and God did it to the wicked. I believe that. You continue on, and we need to praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. If that's all you can do, praise the Lord. He is worthy. Verse 10 says, The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Praise him for who he is. Praise him for what he has done, and praise him because he reigns and he rules. He's as sure as his word here. That's the promise that's being made. Praise the Lord while you have any being. If that's all you have, Praise Him. Give Him proper reverence. Give Him proper space. Speak often of Him. Speak highly of Him. Lift Him up in your heart. Lift Him up verbally unto others. Lift Him up as you sing praises unto Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. 
Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. I, I thought about praising God last night as I was penning this sermon, and it was like every single sermon and song that I tuned into on YouTube as I was preparing this morning, that hymn, praise Him, praise Him, was just ringing through the speakers, just over and over and over. God wants His people to praise Him. He will inhabit it. You want God to come and dwell on earth and live with us? It's not going to be through Christ in the flesh. It's going to be through God in the Spirit. He's going to inhabit our praises. We can have Him with us. Walk with me. Talk with me. Tell me I am His own. We can have that personal relationship with God here now, and we can be preserved. With God here now, we can be relieved. We can have judgment in our favor. We can have our eyes open. We can find find rays to life those that are hurting. We can look to him and just have relief from the cares and woes of this world because above all things, God is in our lives and we've praised him for it. We ought to praise him more. And that's what we're missing. I think we're missing this so much is just properly praising God. How many times do you see people that are in prison? Paul, praising the Lord for his goodness. How many times do you see David thinking that his family is wiped out by the enemy and about to be stoned by his men? Praising the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Your situation is not bad enough that you can't praise God for all that he has done. If you got what you deserved, it would be death and hell followed after it. But God saved you, God spared you, and God is continually blessing you and working in your life. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Let's try that this week. No matter what's going on, often, repeatedly throughout the day, give praise unto him. Ask him for hymns that you can sing back to him. Ask him to remind you of verses that you can recite back to him. Ask him to lead you in your Bible reading to words that you will read and just go, wow, praise the Lord for that. And just give him proper praise and reverence and watch as he abides with you. I think that'll be a good thing for us to try this week.